on World News Tonight. Operations continue. Search and rescue operations continue despite harsh winter conditions with debt tolls rising. Aid assured. Nations around the planet pledge aid to Turkey and Syria regardless of diplomatic tensions. Balloon controversy. China claims that more balloons were sent but unnoticed by the states under Trump. Are their claims real? Find out tonight. Copenhagen lit up. The Danish capital lights up over the winter to keep spirits up and hearts warm. This is Ada Derana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and you're watching World News and we have a number of key stories from across the globe. But leading tonight on our coverage is the horrific situation in the quake hit Turkey and neighboring Syria. Powerful and dangerous aftershocks continue to rattle parts of Turkey near the Syrian border. In Turkey, the death toll from the devastating earthquake continues to soar as, it, as at least 5,000 people have been killed with many more still missing. The WHO predicts that the final death toll to rise eightfold. The death toll from a devastating earthquake in Turkey on Monday has killed thousands both in Turkey and neighboring Syria, with the death toll expected to continue to rise over the coming days and weeks as search and rescue operations continue. However, the WHO predicts that the final death toll could rise to as high as eight times the current number, reaching far above 20,000. The situation was made all the more devastating as an initial 7.8 magnitude quake was followed by a 7.4 magnitude earthquake. Reports of aftershocks magnitude 4 and above were also reported throughout Turkey. In response to the deadly quakes, the EU's Emergency Response Coordination Center announced Monday that it's sending rescue teams to help with the search and rescue efforts with teams from the Netherlands and Romania already on their way. European leaders, including French President Emmanuel Macron and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, also pledged assistance for Turkey. President Yoon Sagir instructed the government on Monday to take steps to provide humanitarian assistance to Turkey. Seoul's foreign ministry says no South Korean nationals have been reported as being among the casualties. Meanwhile, the IAEA says no damage to Turkey's Akuyud nuclear power plant has been reported, but says safety checks are currently being taken. The nuclear plant, which is still under construction, has not reported any issues related to radiological safety or the security of radioactive sources. The IAEA added that extensive diagnostic measures will be taken to make sure that construction and installation operations can continue safely. Meanwhile, rescuers are urgently digging the rubble to locate and research survivors trapped in the debris as repeated aftershocks rattle already weakened buildings, sowing panic and sending any survivors to the streets. The following visuals of this story is graphic. Viewer discretion is strictly advised. On the streets of northwestern Syria, children are wailing, buildings are flattened, and local hospitals are full of bodies. The cause, a devastating 7.8 magnitude earthquake that hit the country on Monday. It was a painfully familiar sight for many Syrian families and rescuers, exhausted by what has been nearly 12 bleak years of bombardment and displacement. Mounds of concrete, steel rods and bundles of clothes lay where multi-storey buildings once stood. In the rebel-held town of Jindaris in Aleppo province, Hamdo al-Sheikh is desperately searching for his family. I'm waiting to pull out my brother and his family, him and his seven children. They pulled out someone, but it was not them. They took him and went away. Each is pulling out his own. May God help us. Millions in northwest Syria have been left vulnerable by years of conflict, according to the United Nations. Strikes and shelling have already traumatized the population and weakened the foundations of many buildings. The following distressing and graphic images show a man sobbing into a bundle of sheets. Inside, his newborn baby, killed after a building collapsed. <laughs> The White Helmets Rescue Service, founded in rebel-held territory to treat those hurt in bombardment, assisted with search efforts.
The group's head told that the volunteers are in a race against time. The cold winter weather has added another challenge for rescue workers who say families have been left exposed in near freezing temperatures and heavy rains. The UN believes 2.9 million people in the region have been displaced and 1.8 million are living in camps. On a more hopeful note, dozens of European, North American and Asian countries have responded to Turkey's appeal for help. Rescue teams have arrived in the hopeful Turkey to provide their much-needed assistance. In a joint statement, EU High Representative Joseph Borrell and the EU Commissioner for Crisis Management Yanis Lenachik said teams had been mobilized from Bulgaria, Croatia, the Czech Republic, Greece, Hungary, Malta and Poland to support first responders on the ground. The United States is coordinating immediate assistance to NATO member Turkey, including teams to support search and rescue efforts. U.S. supported humanitarian partners are also responding to the destruction in Syria. In California, nearly 100 Los Angeles country firefighters and structural engineers, along with a half dozen specially trained dogs, were being sent to Turkey to help with rescue efforts. Britain also sent a 76 search and rescue specialist with equipment and dogs, as well as an emergency medical team, to Turkey. The U.K. also says it's in contact with the U.N. about getting support to victims in Syria. Turkey's Balkan neighbours were also quick to offer help. Serbian state media reported that Serbia is sending search teams to rescue survivors from the rubble, comprising 21 members and three liaison officers from the Interior Ministry's Department of Emergency Situations. The Croatian search and rescue team arrived in Turkey on Monday. The team is composed of 40 experts in urban search and rescue from ruins and 10 search dogs. Bosnia Security Minister Nenad Nesi confirmed that a team of 50 rescuers will be sent from Bosnia to Turkey and procedures for their departure are currently being finalised. From Japan, an advanced team of 18 rescuers departed on Monday night and arrived in Turkey on Tuesday morning. Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced the decision to send relief and expressed his condolences to the victims. Japan plans to dispatch a total of 75 rescuers to Turkey. The Israeli army says it's sending a search and rescue team of 150 engineers, medical personnel and other aid workers to Turkey. The two countries, once close regional allies, are in the process of mending ties after years of tensions. Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he has also approved a request for humanitarian aid for Syria, received through a diplomatic official despite Israel and Syria not having diplomatic relations and the two countries having fought several wars. India is sending two search and rescue teams from its Natural Disaster Response Force to Turkey, comprising 100 personnel as well as specially trained dog squads and equipment for relief efforts. Chinese President Xi Jinping sent condolences to Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. Xu Wei, a spokesperson from the China International Development Corporation Agency, said China is in communication with the authorities of both affected countries. Xu said that the Chinese government stood ready to provide emergency humanitarian aid. The magnitude 7.8 earthquake that struck Turkey and Syria is likely to be one of the deadliest this decade, with a more than 100-kilometer rupture between the Anatolian and the Arabian plates. Here is what scientists said happened beneath the Earth's surface and what to expect in the aftermath. Seismologists say Monday's magnitude 7.8 earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria is probably going to be one of the deadliest this decade. Only two others from 2013 to 2022 were of the same magnitude. Compared to the 6.2 quake that hit Italy in 2016 and killed some 300 people, the Turkey-Syria earthquake released 250 times as much energy, according to one expert. So why was it so bad? The epicenter of the quake was in the Turkish province of Gaziantep and at the relatively shallow depth of about 11 miles on the East Anatolian Fault. It then radiated towards the northeast, bringing devastation to central Turkey and Syria. The severity was due to the fact that the East Anatolian Fault is a strike-slip fault. In those, solid rock plates are pushing up against each other across a vertical fault line, building stress until one slips in a horizontal motion, which releases a tremendous amount of strain. That, in turn, can trigger an earthquake. The San Andreas Fault in California is one of the world's most famous strike-slip faults. In Monday's quake, there was a more than 62-mile rupture between the Anatolian and Arabian plates. Eleven minutes after the initial quake, the region was hit by a 6.7 magnitude aftershock. A 7.5 magnitude quake came hours later, followed by another spasm in the afternoon. Experts say activity is spreading to neighboring faults, and seismicity may continue for a while. Monday's quake already has the highest death toll in Turkey since 1999. 
That year, a tremor of similar magnitude struck a region near Istanbul and killed more than 17,000 people. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and his counterpart Chris Hinkins said that they discussed climate change, security, migration, the economy and expressed their support for Turkey and Syria at their meeting in Canberra, the first since Jacinda Ardern resigned as leader in January. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and New Zealand Prime Minister Chris Hinkins announced USD 11 million in aid for earthquake hit Turkey and Syria. Both leaders pledged a combined total of $11.5 million in aid for victims of the devastating earthquake. During a joint news conference in Canberra, Albanese said that the country would provide an initial $10 million in humanitarian assistance through the Red Cross, Red Crescent and humanitarian agencies. Meanwhile, Hickins, who is on his first state visit to Australia, said Wellington would contribute $1.5 million. In a statement, New Zealand Foreign Minister said the humanitarian contribution will support teams from the Turkish Red Crescent and Syrian Arab Red Crescent to deliver essential relief items such as food supplies, tents and blankets and provide life-saving medical assistance to psychological support. Prime Minister Chris Himkins discussed the economy, climate and security in his first official meeting with Australian Prime Minister. Albany is also of the deep friendship between the two nations during a joint news conference after the pair met today. The Canberra visit in Hipkins' first official meeting with a world leader since becoming Prime Minister following his appearance at Waitangi, where he tried setting a new tone on co-governance. Hipkins flew to Canberra today morning. He was greeted by officials at the airport and given a traditional indigenous welcome to country and smoke ceremony to the grounds of the New Zealand High Commission. We're going into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back. Now the crisis engulfing the Adani group has intensified as hundreds of members of India's opposition parties took to the streets to press for an investigation into allegations by the U.S. short seller against India's second biz uh, biggest business group, which triggered its market rout. Now for more on this, we have our Bidane World News Special Correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekra, joining us from Delhi in India. Gayatri, over to you. Yes, Shenali. Members of the opposition Congress party have been urging the Prime Minister Narendra Modi to order an investigation into Adani Group companies after a US-based short-selling firm Hindesburg Research has accused them of various fraudulent practices. The Adani Group has denied any wrongdoing. In Delhi, Congress party workers threw fake currency notes in the air and chanted slogans. Some burned a suitcase plastered with images of Modi and the Adani Group head Gautam Adani. Some protested scale police barricades and were detained and taken away in police vans. Opposition party workers in the financial capital Mumbai and the southern city of Chennai gathered outside of the offices of state-run bank and the country's largest insurer which are known to have investment in Adani shares. So far, there is no sign, uh, sign the phrase is spreading across India's financial sector and the protests are more a reflection of political theater rather than spontaneous public outrage. Lawmakers disrupted parliament for a third day on Monday as calls mounted for India's market regulator to look into Hindenburg claims. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News Special Correspondent Gatri Gunasekar reporting from Delhi in India. U.S. officials said that improvements ordered by President Joe Biden to strengthen defenses against Chinese espionage helped to identify last week's spy balloon and to determine that similar flights were conducted at multiple points during the Trump administration. The U.S. Coast Guard imposed a temporary security zone in the waters off South Carolina on Monday as the military collected debris from a suspected Chinese spy balloon shot down by a U.S. fighter jet over the weekend. China called the shooting down of the balloon an obvious overreaction and urged the U.S. to show restraint over the episode. Outside the White House, President Joe Biden insisted that the incident had not weakened U.S.-China relations. So, we made it clear to China what we're going to do. They understand our position. We're not going to back off. We did the right thing. And there's not a bad question of weakening or strengthening. It's just reality. Has it always been your view to shoot down a Chinese spy balloon, or was it only because it became public? Oh, no, it was always my position. Once it came over the United, into the United States, 
from Canada. I uh, told the Defense Department wanted to shoot it down as soon as it was appropriate. They concluded, they concluded we should not shoot it down over land. It was not a serious threat, and we should wait till it got across the water. The balloon led U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken to postpone a planned visit to China, but as of Monday, there was no update on when it might be rescheduled. We are, uh, we haven't had uh, conversations at this point uh, about rescheduling the trip. Meanwhile, Air Force General Glenn Van Herc, who was responsible for bringing down the balloon, said previous spy balloons had flown undetected by the U.S. military in what he called a, quote, awareness gap. The Pentagon said over the weekend that Chinese spy balloons had briefly flown over the United States at least three times during President Donald Trump's administration and one time previously under President Joe Biden. Van Herc said the balloon shot down on Saturday was 200 feet tall with a payload underneath that weighed a couple thousand pounds. Van Herc did not rule out that there could have been explosives on the balloon, but said he did not have any evidence of it either. That risk, however, was a factor in his planning to shoot down the balloon over open water. Fine dust levels in South Korea remain high for the second straight day. Authorities have decided to expand emergency measures to more parts of the country to reduce dust emissions. Murky skies blanket South Korea on Tuesday. The National Institute of Environmental Research predicts the fine dust level will hit bad levels in the capital area, Chungcheongdo and Jeollado provinces, and Daegu city. Based on the Korea Meteorological Administration classifications, that means those areas will have fine dust concentrations of between 81 and 150 micrograms. An ultra-fine dust advisory has also been issued to the city of Incheon, as well as Gyeonggi-do, Chungcheongbuk-do, and Jeollabuk-do provinces on Tuesday morning, with these areas seeing large amounts of ultra-fine dust particles, which are smaller than 2.5 micrometers in diameter. The Environment Ministry attributes this to a combination of air stagnation and smog coming from neighboring China. The ministry has deployed emergency fine dust reduction measures for the capital area and Sejong City for two straight days. They'll be in effect from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Tuesday. Under these measures, large-scale dust emitters such as coal power plants and construction areas must adjust or reduce their operation hours. The driving of grade 5 diesel cars, the lowest of the country's five tiers of emission standards, will be banned. Water wagons and de-dusting cars will clean roads more frequently. And senior citizens or those with respiratory illnesses should refrain from going out and are advised to wear a mask if they go outdoors. The skies should clear from Wednesday afternoon. Google unveiled a new chatbot tool, dubbed Bard, in an apparent bid to compete with the viral success of OpenAI's ChatGPT. Competition for the best in artificial intelligence, or AI, is heating up. Google parent Alphabet on Monday announced plans to launch BARD, an artificial intelligence chatbot service. BARD will be released to test users before being released to the public in the coming weeks. Powering BARD is Lambda, Google's AI that can generate prose so human-like that a company engineer last year called it sentient or able to perceive or feel things. It claimed the technology giant and scientists widely dismissed. This news follows recent statements by Microsoft that it aims to infuse AI into all its products following the launch of the explosively popular ChatGPT, the chatbot sensation which can generate articles, essays, jokes, and even poetry in response to prompts. Microsoft is an investor in and partner with ChatGPT's maker OpenAI. It has been rated the fastest growing consumer app in history. Alphabet chief executive Sundar Pichai said Google also plans to add AI-powered features to its search engine to synthesize information to answer complex queries. Pachai said Google will give tools, first powered by Lambda and later by other AI technology, to web developers, creators, and enterprises starting next month. Welcome back to World News Tonight, and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A landslide triggered by strong winds in Peru killed at least eight people. Peru's National Emergency Center, COEN, said search and rescue efforts are still ongoing. Crews in eastern Ohio conducted operations to drain and burn off an unstable toxic chemical cargo from five rail cars of a freight train that derailed a fire wreck 
three days earlier, prompting mass evacuations. Philippine immigration authorities deported two of the four Japanese fugitives suspected of being involved in a series of robberies in Japan. LeBron James may be on the verge of breaking one of the most converted records in sports, but his teammates said that his focus on is to help the Lakers climb in the standings as not the 36 points of which is needed to become the NBA's all-time leading scorer. Aaron Finch has announced his retirement from T20's internationals, bringing an end to his Australian career, meaning that there will be a new captain when the team next take the field later this year. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. And in case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And we leave you tonight with illuminated bridges, buildings and light art scattered around the city that light up the Danish capital for the next three weeks. February is one of the darkest months of the year, but during the 23rd Day Light Festival, which started at the weekend, people in Pope and Hagen will be able to enjoy some much needed light. Stay safe and have a good night.